A long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, George Lucas has not yet made a galaxy far, far away, and he's still an itty-bitty baby auteur peddling his nostalgic self-reflection coming-of-age story to general audiences, with the help of Francis Ford Coppola. It netted him fame, fortune, and a bunch of Oscar nominations, but how can this deeply personal bit of self-indulgence measure up against its much more successful younger sibling? This episode contains discussion of sexual assault and 1960s sexual politics, as well as insight into how George Lucas views those. Listener discretion is advised. Additionally, this episode has some audio issues due to personal matters, so I apologize in advance for that. Call it method editing if that makes it seem more like a choice than an unfortunate necessity. there, and welcome to Six Degrees of Star Wars, the podcast where we explore all the ways George Lucas's flagship franchise surrounds us, binds us, and penetrates us in the landscape of cinema. I'm your host, Sam Marcioni. Joining me today is Ellie McConaughey. You know, I'm a dirty bird. I'm not grungy. I'm bitten. And Grady Smithy. I had to sell my Jeep in order to buy a horse. <laughs> Apologies for the little hiatus, folks. I hope you enjoyed the outtakes, and we are back in it with the most Lucas filmy of all the degree ones. American graffiti. <laughs> George, what the fuck? I believe the, the backstory behind this one is just that Coppola challenged him, like, hey, could you make a movie that people want to watch, dude? And this is what he made. Yeah. And he and shopped he it around for a while Wars. before he found somebody to pick it up. Yeah, Coppola had to put his name on it before people would pick it up, right? I'm still staring into the abyss. This movie. This movie is nothing. It's a nothing movie. This is a playlist. It is a playlist. It is kind of a play. I don't know. I, I want to be nicer to this movie than I am to some other movies. Because I do kind of like, you know, I don't know. I don't know what the term is for this kind of genre where it's like, well, some teenagers, it's one night, a bunch of stuff happens. Some of it matters. Most of it doesn't. That's movie you know I, i'm fond of that genre and it is not exactly dramatic on a cosmic scale by any means but it is a night that's the turning point in a number of lives mm -hmm. it's just way too much of a look into how george lucas views sexual dynamics and sexual politics and also everybody owes the prequels an apology because george lucas was never good at relationships no <laughs> Yeah, you know, I, I wasn't sure when I was going to say this, but one of my first notes when I was organizing my thoughts for this was, and I quote, it says a lot about George that the healthiest relationship in the entire movie is a guy in his 20s and a 12-year-old. That that whole segment was like... And I, this is my first. the 12-year-old keeps threatening rape. Yeah, it was such a... The, the vibes there are real rancid, I will, I will say. But, you know, I don't know... I, I kept waiting for that to go worse than it was. So maybe I'm just being, I don't know. I thought it was kind of like cute in a roundabout sort of way. I don't, it does make me kind of uncomfortable at points. Like the, there's a segment towards the end of it where he's like pretending to come on to her to get him, to get her to like leave, basically. Well, so that he's doing that so that he can get her address so that he can take her home. So yeah, at, that. He, you know, he, he, it's like no other thing that he has done has gotten her to say, where can I get you to someplace where you will be safe? In a maybe more delicate director's hands, it could come off as kind of like, she's got a crush and he's like nicely but calmly shutting her down at every turn. It could be, it could be a little bit more, but it doesn't really get the focus. It's not really the focus of the movie. I actually don't know what I would say is the focus of the movie. I mean, I want to say that Sofia Coppola maybe could have pulled it off, but no. Also, Sofia Coppola, I don't think existed back then. She did not. Uh, the other, the other director I was going to go was another person who didn't exist back then, which is a uh, Celine Sciamma, who was very adept at handling complicated relationship stuff with younger characters. Yeah, but just you know how it turns out that like. Star Wars is George Lucas's Hidden Fortress fanfic with his self-insert. Uh -huh. Well, 
looking at like the behind the scenes of this movie, this is George Lucas making multiple OCs of himself. Like all the white guys who I can't tell apart except I know that the redhead named Steve is Ron Howard. All of them are some flavor of George Lucas as teenager. I think Terry is the one that's closest to how George actually was. With Kurt as a potential competitor there. But yeah, Steve and Milner were definitely also his OCs. I, I think that actually, like, so to establish myself, like, I'm not like a George Lucas biography expert. But what I do know of him, I, I think he was a little bit more of the Kurt type, you know, kind of conflicted. I feel like the end card kind of like throws that in my face though that's just such a depressing way to end the movie i did not like that end card at all I, two I, of these guys are dead one's selling insurance and one's a writer in canada is the implication there supposed to be that he like fled to canada to avoid the draft is that is that absolutely right? okay so i'm not crazy this was released during a time when people were leaving to canada so that they would not be sent to vietnam and I'm pretty sure that even if Lucas had wanted to make it explicit, the studio would not have been happy with that. So he has Terry going missing in action mm -hmm. before that, so that anybody who was around during that time will be like, oh, yeah, that. I think, I don't know, like, I didn't like the title card at all. I think if it had ended on the shot of him staring out the plane window as he's flying off, would have been a much stronger ending. But that's me. I don't know if there's a way that this movie ends strongly because it just it meanders all over the place like maybe if it had been an anthology film that stuck with each of the boys for their entire thing i might have been down for it i just this was not a movie that Marsha could save in the editing room she, no. she's there but she couldn't save it i i mentioned this to grady that like i'm still i'm doing a bunch of recording this week including for my podcast about oscar winning movies and this is not an oscar winning movie it is not eligible for my podcast although uh the woman who played um i think it's somebody look i got my wiki in here. debbie debbie yeah debbie was nominated for an oscar it got picture director screenplay and yes marsha lucas was nominated for editing along with verna fields I don't know, like, I, I think that they, the... They okay. tried. I, I think the ending is kind of, like, where it kind of loses me, because it's very clearly intended to be, like, all the plot threads come together kind of moment. But, like, the the element of the film that I like the most is that they these plots kind of keep bouncing off each other a little bit, but they're never really, like, intertwined until that moment. Yeah. I mean, it's not a good sign when I literally have written in my notes, please let a horror movie start. <laughs> So which, which of the characters do you hate the most? Come on, hit me with it. Bob Ralpha. Mm, that's fair. Ralpha is pretty bad. Ralpha, Ralpha, I don't know. That's a fucking Star Wars name, but what kind of man picks up a high school girl, drives around in his little drag race car singing fucking South Pacific? George. You had to pay money to get Harrison to do that because you would have needed the licensing. George! The song rights were one of the biggest budget line items in the entire thing, by the way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Obviously. I can't imagine why. Does, does James Gunn really like this movie? I feel like James Gunn must really like this movie. It, it's interesting because, like, I I'm I don't want to say this with any authority because I haven't like I didn't actually pay this close attention until towards the end. I feel like there's if there is a a normal soundtrack, it's extremely underplayed. It feels like the the mixtape songs are are the main form of the soundtrack. Yeah, because it's obvious that he wanted to capture the spirit of what it's like to just be out driving around with your friends on a night in whatever part of the 60s exactly this is happening in. Mm, I think it's 63. Looking at, okay, 62, Modesto. Yeah, like the setting is two months before the Cuban Missile Crisis. And, okay, I, I don't know. My brain is very tired and I'm still like kind of soup. 
trying to process this movie when it was starting and like all the hot rods were pulling up to the diner i'm like oh so like i'm getting some vibes from this that i feel like they tried to replicate in book of boba fett and like i actually liked the hot rod mod squad whatever the fuck they were called in the book of boba fett so i'm like this might be fun i was wrong it's kind of weird like uh you know usually with you know, you, you go back to like you're you're watching The Matrix and you go back and you discover Bound. You know, they you've got the really big breakout movie and then you go back and you watch some of the earlier stuff like, okay, I see like the beginnings of fixations and interests and styles that will become more fleshed out in their later films. I don't see any of that in American graffiti. Uh maybe that was just like common to to filmmakers of that generation in a way it isn't common now like i don't i don't look at finian's rainbow and see the director who made the godfather in there um it's a you know very objective camera i don't know it's i was going to say we should probably address the plot lines one by one because they're not very they're not very long each of the plot lines individually actually before we do that i want to return to your question about which one do you hate the most because yeah. The reason why I don't hate Bob Falfa the most is because Steve. Steve oh, is God, the fucking yeah. worst. Steve does fucking suck, and it's a testament to Ron Howard just being a doofy, likable guy that I can't hate him. Yeah, Ron Howard's charisma is the only thing that makes you not want him to get hit by Falfa's car when it flips over and catches fire. I... I, I want to say that I hate Steve the most, but if I'm being honest with myself, the answer is that I hate Terry the most. Terry just kind of like, I don't, I don't know what I'm supposed to do with this plot. He lies to a girl a bunch. They sleep together. I guess he kind of gets his comeuppance. He does get the shit beaten out of him at one point. Oh no, Terry's pathetic. I, I didn't. I was expecting like when the movie was starting and we were getting the plot set up. I was expecting to hate Kurt. I didn't. Um, yeah, because Kurt's know. just Kurt kind of just has that lovable doofus energy of being like hard eyes over a sex worker he doesn't know, and then kind of accidentally getting roped into other people's bullshit. Mostly, well, we don't that know part, that she's a sex worker. That's just one of the rumors about her. Yeah, but I mean, like, even if she is a sex worker, he's still down for that because it's I, Suzanne Summers. I also the other reason I think I'm I'm more forgiving to Kurt is he is like on the one hand a cab he does do a really excellent a cab moment. Oh god, uh, that was fucking rad. So great. But also uh, he is the source of my favorite scene in the entire movie, which is the one at the radio station. Yeah, I I like that. That's the scene that I'm gonna go like. I don't know if I'm gonna say the force is with this movie or not, yeah. but I liked. I liked that scene. That scene was very, very small and like kind of funny, but kind of sad in a way that I, I appreciate. Well, yeah, because Wolfman Jack was one of the biggest celebrities in that era. And he's just a guy powering through an entire box of popsicles because the freezer doesn't work anymore. Mm -hmm. Sitting in a radio booth. Was that the real dude? I, I have... That was the actual Wolfman Jack, yeah. That's kind of rad. That's kind of rad. Oh, yeah. That's fun. More shit like that. More, you know, Kurt, whatever your last name was, this will be your life if you if you don't get out. Maybe this town rips the bones from your back. It's a death <laughs> trap. It's a Actually, the this will be your life if you don't get out was the teacher that he thought was the cool teacher when he was in high school mm -hmm. who confesses to him that he went to college, burned out, now he's teaching high school, and then you discover that he knocked up one of his students. Ah! Like, that is what the we 60s, y'all. I missed that part. I that kind of well, it's the sort of thing that... My eyes just kind of glaze over because there's so much, like, exposition and, like, right. everything that people complain about in the prequels, I feel like it's worse here. But it, it that's the sort of thing characters. that these are paper dolls. Yeah, just if 
I didn't realize that that's what was going on until like the second or third time I watched the movie. And then, you know, she's very tense and they have to go off and and have a talk. And I'm like, holy shit. I don't know. Like, I, I had a thought and it's completely gone. So my brain is very tired. Yeah, I don't know. We should probably actually talk about the, the actual plot lines. They do start out kind of together. Yeah, at that drive-in that makes me nostalgic for a time that never existed for me. Like, by the time I was child, gathering places like this for teens were already dying out. You know, most of my high school time, there was like a teen center in the center of town that people went to sometime. I actually saw Paul Simon there once. Cool. But I wasn't, I didn't really frequent there until my senior year when I started working there. I mostly hung out at friend's house, you know, but by 2004 to 2008, like that was my high school years. The third place for, for teens was already on the decline. It's pretty much dead at this point. Yeah, so I am, as has been previously established on other episodes of this podcast, an old TM. And I was around for the waning days of when the third place was whatever the main street in town was on a Friday night. You just got in your car and drove up one side, down the other. And so it's just, I I got a thin taste of what it was like for these kids in this movie. And it's kind of fascinating to have seen the changes in what third places are available that took place. We had a skating rink in town and that was basically it and then there was a mall and there was some place to hang out and then somewhere along the way didn't really have the mall anymore and don't really have third places like we used to and god i'm feeling old right now sorry i find teen movies of the 60s 70s and 80s kind of interesting when they are snapshots of the actual moment they were in you know like i really liked bottoms from last year i really liked not at all surprising bottoms fucking rocks but like so good but that is a that is a snapshot of a version of like teen high school that it might be kind of like more accurate to how it feels to be in high school but it's not accurate to how high school actually ever was whereas i feel like if this movie has anything i feel like it is a little more grounded, a little more like a little more something that could exist as a as an example of what because George Lucas would have been in his teens in sixty two, right? Like he this would have been Yep. Yeah. I I don't know again, I don't know if he's really like good enough. I, I don't think I will be breaking any hearts either in the podcast or in our audience when I say I don't think George Lucas is a very talented writer. Um I don't, that's not like necessarily a slam. Some people have skills who lie elsewhere. He's not a very complicated or very nuanced writer, as evidenced by uh, Act of the Clones. Harrison Ford famously said to him about the original Star Wars script, George, you can write this shit, but you can't read it. Right. That's, it's and not I just think Attack of the Clones. Every single script George Lucas has ever made is just, I know writers who use subtext, they're all cowards. R- right. And I feel like uh, this was still early enough in in his career that you could either have actors are going to be like no i'm gonna take this line and i'm gonna like say it my way and make it sound more like human dialogue and also actors who are like more famous than george lucas or even just like no he's not a famous dude like his previous movie had bombed pretty hard so they could tell him fuck off george i need a minute to like do my process leave me alone so i can make this feel authentic Whereas by the time we roll around to 2000, to the prequels, you know, I don't feel, I, I feel like that is my, my assessment of the prequels acting in, in, uh, in retrospect. These are actors who are not getting the time to do their process to give an authentic performance. I, I will say in episodes two and three, Hayden Christensen was giving George exactly the performance that George wanted. And that's the problem. But we digress. I don't I mean, think even Hayden Christensen... in this movie, if you taking into account the idea that the actors are having a chance to do their process, there's some weird, weird fucking line reads in there that just like I think what's his name Milner. Milner, the uh, the yeah, like, hot rod driver slash aging gunfighter. Type. Yeah, he. He had a weird one, and I don't know, I don't remember what it is, because I don't timestamp my notes, 
But after I questioned one of his takes at like the diner or something, I just stopped the movie for a second and was like, was that Stephen Tobolowski? Was it Stephen Tobolowski? I don't think it was Stephen Tobolowski. I swear to God, there's a guy in this movie who looks like Stephen Tobolowski, but I don't think Stephen Tobolowski is in this movie. Which is, that's a shame because I love Stephen Tobolowski. He's such a guy's a treasure. Mm -hmm. Such a good character actor. One of the greatest. I swear to God, if anybody punches him, it's going to hurt me more than Rick Moranis and Steve Buscemi getting punched dead. (laughs) No, like, I looked it up. It says Paul Lamatt played Milner, and I don't know what else he's been in. No, 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 no. I don't think that Stephen oh. Tobolowski was Milner, but there was like a guy, maybe it was the teacher or something. S- some older character in the movie looked like Stephen Tobolowski. It's just. I think it was the I guy had. who, one of the two guys who owned the mini golf place. Maybe? Hmm. I don't that's know. a weird scene. That that's just another thing. This is an ensemble movie, but the ensemble is too fucking big. Yeah, they, like if you're gonna have this many characters, you need to have them in little zoom boxes with their names labeling them. <laughs> yeah, there there's there's a lot of characters, and on the one hand, I wanna like I like that it doesn't feel the need to to exposit like here is here is why Terry, this absolute dork, is hanging out with Steve or John or Kurt. Like they're just friends. Roll with it. Uh, but on the other hand, like every so often, they'll run into some dude who clearly has like history with these dudes. Like who the fuck is that? What the fuck are the fair? Oh, they're gang. Yeah. What's happening? Why is all they this wandered happening? in from the set of West Side Story? They really did. I was actually gonna go with the Warriors reference. But I guess if they were the warriors and they were named the pharaohs, they'd wear like gold masks or something. Well, the the pharaohs are authentic to at least how people perceived the teen gangs that were rampant in the late 50s, early 60s. They banded together. They chose a name they thought was cool. They would get jackets with the name of the gang on there to advertise. This is what we're a part of. Back the fuck up. And they would just completely curb stomp people who they got a bad mood about Fair. the 50s and 60s were a wild goddamn time okay but i have to ask chicken fink was that like actual slang because that's up there with nerf herder for me yeah i think maybe i i don't know i it sounded like something that he meant to go with chicken shit and somebody said george you can't use that <laughs> well didn't he say wasn't there a fuck said later in the show in the movie I, I don't know. I'm I'm tired. It it is always kind of like distressing how movie any movie about teens instantly has to completely feel inauthentic to the actual teen experience because they can't say fuck more than once without getting an R rating. And like, I'm sorry, I went to high school. I would say fuck more than once more than once a minute sometimes. Still do. In hiding your fucks. Or just like, don't worry about it. You know, it was extremely weird when eighth grade got rated R and everyone was like, this is weird. Why are we doing this? And then no one did anything. Good movie. I know we're jumping around, but like the the thing when they're in the car and Carol turns on the radio and Milner turns off the radio, did they did they reference that in the Mandalorian? Was that what the baby with the button was about? I mean, it's a pretty it's a pretty common joke set up i don't know if this is the originator of that particular punchline i this is my first time seeing this movie i was extremely surprised to find out that like the bit in the simpsons episode summer of four foot two where homer's like you know give me this give me that give me that and i'm talking about fireworks i mean that 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 was a direct reference to this movie yep that was a pretty funny scene Mm -hmm. there are reasonably successful scenes here and there in the movie, you know, I Perry I think has the largest majority of like actual comedy scenes. The bit with the car salesman is a very weird, very disconnected scene. It was funny. The scene you, you mentioned this the the scene of the liquor store, a whole bit at the liquor store was very funny. Oh my I, god, I love that bit. <laughs> I question how long he was out there trying to get somebody to buy him the booze. Debbie I, is a very patient girl. 
she is a very patient girl. I don't get why she just decides to keep hanging out with this dude. He's younger than Stephen Kurt, right? Yes, like he okay. is still not graduated from high school. He's either just starting his junior year or just starting his senior year because he has a license. I am going to hope he is just starting his senior year and he had like an August birthday or something because I would not like to think about teenagers fucking. Like, I know that teenagers fuck. I just... There's always that line, you know, like when Game of Thrones had Maisie Williams do a sex scene in the final season and even though like she was fully an adult when they filmed that sex scene, I'm like, but that's a baby. I saw her as a baby and now she's fucking. She was ready to, to I think, what, what's, what year did uh, Game of, the final season of Game of Thrones come out? 2019. I guess New Mutants was after that, but it filmed before that. Also, she doesn't actually go through with sex and with what's-her-face and all. Never mind. Terrible movie. Don't watch it. Like, if teenagers want to fuck other teenagers, I'm not here to police that. I'm just always a little uncomfortable with how adults film the concept of teenagers fucking. Yeah, that's totally fair. It was. That's, that's reasonable. It's interesting because, like, the reason I was confused is because, like, he looks younger than the rest of the cast, but none of the main cast really look convincingly like teenagers to me you know i'm just looking at them like yeah that's just richard dreyfus i know what richard dreyfus looks like movie come on i mean but... they definitely had to get adults given how much was filmed at night yeah definitely and usually it's just like no matter what time you're shooting it's usually just good business to like you're shooting season one of buffy sarah michelle Gellar should probably just be 18 it's probably just easier for everyone it's fine i people make fun of it when teenagers don't look like teenagers, you know, oh, they're not actually teenagers, who gives a shit? It's a movie. You know, we're not watching boyhood here, we can live with it. The easiest way to make them look like teenagers is to stick them up next to Harrison Ford. Because I swear to God, that man was born 30. I thought the easiest way to make them look like teenagers is to put a bunch of makeup on their face, some curly hair, uh, make them sing about this, this is a Dear Evan Hansen joke that I'm just I'm pulling the pulling the eject button on because I don't know where I'm going with it. Oh God, fucking Dear Evan Hansen. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I I, I was said we should probably approach like each of the storylines, but I don't know how to like individually. And most of them are kind of like wisps of nothing, you know. Kurt. Steve. Kurt, Steve subplot in like three sentences. He's trying to convince his girlfriend to let him cheat on her or else put out for him. And she's pissed at him basically the entire night. And then we find out that it's very likely that he has cheated on her already with that waitress. <sighs> yeah, you know, John's subplot is he's driving around with a 12-year-old who he can't get to leave. Um, and also... Actually, there's one Milner story than that. And also Harrison Ford wants to raise him. And no, also just, like, there's a discount officer Krupke after him. Yes. But like, like, like I said earlier, he's the aging gunfighter type. Did Does the thing with the officer Krupke ever get resolved? No. No? Okay. Except insofar as we get to see the cop car axle get taken off. Was because the all cops in this town are definitely... I don't remember if that was him or not. It's just... The last we see him is him threatening to uh, to bust Milner, uh, but only writing him the 752nd citation that's stuffed in his glove compartment. But Milner is the aging gunfighter type in the archetype of the street racer. And there is no such thing as an old gunfighter. And there's also no such thing as an old street racer because they all wind up having something cut them down hopefully in their prime but yeah that i wasn't sure exactly when i was going to bring up the scene in the junkyard but that for me is the scene that really made the movie and made me realize jesus christ when F when lucas puts in the effort and when he gets the right actor that man can work magic i did like the scene in the junkyard it's yeah it, again it's very like kind of small scale and sad you know there there is there is a pathos to to John in the movie in that he's like, you know, oh I'm the I'm the best drag racer in in this, you know, 
I don't know much about Modesta, but I, I'm not under the impression of like a big important city. And he's just like, yeah, what are you going to do with that? You're going to either hang it up or you're going to get killed doing it. Those are your choices. Yeah, the, the kids he went to school with idolize him because he's a great driver. Everyone mm. else is either another driver that wants to take his title away or one of the people that goes to the auto shop where he, where he earns a living. He has nothing except the fame of a thing that he is gradually aging out of his ability to do it. And when he's showing Mackenzie Phillips around all the cars, he's pointing to the last thing that he ever saw friends of his alive in. And he says, and now they just put them on movies that they show you in Driver's Ed. People that he knew, hated, loved, who knows, all that their legacy is, is a cautionary tale. And he knows that someday that's probably going to be him. Like, then title card is like, yeah, you're right. You get hit by a drunk driver. Yeah. That is one of the reasons. Oh, why old gunfighters. Oh, well, I didn't really like the title cards at the end. It was like the the advantage of a of a teen movie with a kind of ambiguous ending like that is that you can like you can hope that this guy gets out like maybe he's, I don't think he's ever gonna like you know go be famous because yeah you know I don't know when NASCAR started but it's not like he's gonna go drive NASCAR or whatever but you can you know that you can leave it ambiguous whether he he says like he, his final conversation he has in the movie with uh with Terry. He basically says, like, yeah, Harrison Ford, whose name completely escapes me in the movie, but Harrison Ford, he crashed. He was winning. Like, I was, I was done. And like, there's so many, I felt like, I felt like there was an indication there that he wanted to, to call it quits at that point. But, but it's all he has. Yeah. That's a bummer. That's the bummer of it. Yeah. That's how you end up with a, what's his name? I think it's Matthew McConaughey in Days of Confused. This movie actually kind of reminds me of Days of Confused a little bit. Yeah, it's the same sort of, here are some people, here's what happens to them on a specific time, now let's go do something else. So that's that's uh, John's plot line. What would you, what would you say uh, Kurt's plot line is? Kurt's plot line is he's wrestling with his fear of not being able to cut it in college. I think he was also wrestling with his fear of getting the shit beaten out of him by some... Teen gangers. Yeah, I, yeah. I do love like the fact that you've got one of the smartest kids in the entire school gets trapped up with these punks and they wind up embracing him as one of their own when he at least holds up bro code and doesn't snitch on them. High intelligence, low wisdom, high charisma. Yes. And so, you know, his struggle is, am I going to be able to cut it? Wouldn't it be safer if I don't just try? And then he has the talk with the uh, Wolfman, and that helps him realize that, no, I have to do this because maybe I'll fail. But what's worse, the possibility that I fail or never finding out whether I would? And that does feel the most like what George would ended up being, like with THX 1138 having just yeah. bombed completely in this this did really, really well at, like, the box office and everything, but, you know, the next thing George did would completely eclipse it forever and yep. ever and ever. Uh, yeah, and Kurt, Kurt's also, like, obsessed with this this woman he saw for, like, five seconds in a car, and he also gets, like, kicked out of a car by... I wasn't actually clear on who these two women were. It's an ex-girlfriend of his and her friend. Yeah, I I was... It was an interesting, it was like a weird scene because he's kind of got the dickhead to them. Oh, yeah. There's no kind of about it. He is just a dick. Yeah. As I said, I like I like the scene where he goes to to see Wolfman Jack at the radio station. I think that's probably my favorite scene in the movie because, like, there, there's this sense, like, he, you know, Wolfman Jack is talking about how he's, you know, the, the character been all around the world, seen all these things, and he's just sitting there in this little radio station. In and yeah, he's a big celebrity, but he doesn't like. They're DJ celebrities are in a weird, in a weird spot as far as like creatives go, because they and I, I do think he was chosen, like a DJ celebrity was chosen with this thought in mind, because like they, they are famous, they are known. But not really for anything they themselves do. 
you know, they don't, you know, some, usually they have a music career, but that's not really what they're famous for. They usually have like an acting career or something. That's not really what they're famous for. So there is a, there is a sad, you know, there, there, there's yeah. a song, The Last DJ. Um, there is a sadness to it that I think that scene manages to capture very, very well. The, the guy, the wolf man, the actual wolf man, Jack, you know, embodies that very, very well. I think it's probably accurate to his experience. I don't know much about Wolfman Jack, so I can't speak to how accurately this portrays him, but that's my favorite scene in the movie. And I guess that means that Kurt's my favorite plot thread. Totally valid. Yeah, and it's just he's the biggest name on radio, and he can't afford a fridge that has a functioning freezer in it. And you've got the moment of pathos where he's talking about how he's just a guy getting older in a booth, and then the instant the song ends and it's time for him to do a little bit of patter before the next one starts the character comes on. can't relate to that at all as a podcaster nope i know right i like that shot where he first comes into the radio and like he sees him but his like entire face is hidden in shadow yeah that's a good shot george lucas is a much better visual storyteller than he is a a, a verbal storyteller and then there's terry's uh, yeah. plot line Actually, can we do Steve first? Because his plotline is the the mirror in reverse of Kurt's. He's absolutely certain that he wants to go and that everything's going to be perfect and that his life is going to be exactly the way that it is. And he slowly loses his confidence in that and does what Kurt was originally thinking of doing and staying. Also, can oh. I just say, Steve, it's college in the Northeast. It's full of assholes. Steve would have fit in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he is the mirror to um, what's his name to Kurt, but his his change feels a lot less motivated. Um, and I I don't like being too hard on teenage characters who are assholes. I was an asshole when I was a teenager. Oh, man, <sighs> he just kind of sucks. Oh no, he absolutely does. He tries to guilt his girlfriend that he has told i want to date other people to see if i still like you into having sex with him and when she doesn't he throws the fact that she one time looked at she one time watched her brother have sex with his girlfriend in her face also like george why did steve is horrible that as the thing why why did we need to know that i didn't even know that i never need to know that don't tell if that's true for you don't tell me don't tell me anything about your brother which is why she very justifiably kicks him the fuck out of her car and drives off there's like a five minute sequence or i guess it's like five minutes of screen time but it's like because of the they're following other plot lines i guess it's more like a 20 minute sequence where she's like hanging out in Harrison Ford's car. I'm like, there's an upgrade. I guess Harrison Ford's also kind of a piece of shit, but and he's Harrison Ford. At least he's not going to try and force her into having sex with him. He's a... Uh... Not yet. No! There's a, uh, you know, to quote another horrible person, you know, he's not going to try to force her, but, you know, there's the implication. Uh, well, he's in the say... car that made the Modesto run in 12 parsecs. Yes, yeah, so there's... But he, they'd never say no, you know, because of the implication. So that character is horrible and always sees consequences for it. Honestly, I thought for a minute they were going to kill him. I thought they were going to kill him when he crashed his car. That would be a little grim for this movie, I yeah. think. They were saving the grim for the title card? Yeah, it's it's got a weird tone, this movie. It's like 80% yeah. a comedy, but then it has like two or three scenes that are really dark or sad, yeah. and I don't know what to do with that. Well, this is how comedy movies were being done in that particular part of the 70s. There's a lot of stuff that is amusing, and then they will just have something that just hits you in the face with a brick. I am I, really curious to know how much of this screenplay we should be attributing to George and how much to Gloria Katz and Willard Quick. H-U-Y-C-K. I... I do I'm, not know how you pronounce that. I don't know how you pronounce it either, but I have to say it this way. Hyuk? Oh, God, no. No, it's, uh, I, I mean, like, I, so the movie that I covered for my last podcast episode was a, a comedy drama from 74, and it also kind of did that, but I feel like it managed the the tone shifts between the the sad scenes and the comic scenes 
a lot better by just having both of them be a lot more understated. Whereas, like, every so often, this film gets super wacky. Like, the whole sequence where Kurt basically, like, causes a cop car to rip its own rear axle off, that's, like, a wacky scene. Yeah. And then, like, you've got, again, like, a very, like, and that, you know, that is basically what happens to the car crash. You know, they're both car crashes, essentially. That is a wacky car crash. And then the one at the end is a very grim, very, like, scary looking car crash. Welcome to the 70s. It's supposed to get more, like, downbeat and realistic in the 70s. That's their whole vibe. Yes, but Ellie, the important thing is that it rhymes. It rhymes. I'm not going to lie to y'all. They do if one of the if one of the pitches they've got for um for a you know a TV show or like a smaller Star Wars movie is American graffiti type movie but set in Tashi State Station, I would fucking watch that. I mean, I'm sure graffiti. they were pitching that, but it. then everybody fucking hated the Book of Boba Fett. I didn't fucking hate the Book of Boba Fett. I didn't watch the Book of Boba Fett. Book of Boba Fett was the first time I actually enjoyed watching anything to do with Boba Fett, but, like, they got one of the girls from Yellow Jackets to leave, like, a squad of gracers or something, and everybody I saw on the internet fucking hated her character. They hated her character and group of renegade bike racers. I... Do I need to watch Book of Boba Fett again to properly explain this to you? Sophie Thatcher is there. I don't know how oh. big a Yellow Jackets thing, but Sophie Thatcher. I think she's a, a major character. She's who I think she is. Um, I like Yellow Jackets a lot. I, no, that wasn't like a slam on the Book of Boba Fett. I haven't watched anything Star Wars related really since Rise of Skywalker. I didn't even watch the first season of The Mandalorian. I thought you watched Andor. Nope. So I'm watching Andor. Oh, I'm People mixing it up with somebody else then. We are wildly off topic, so I'll end this sentence. Yeah, we, we have one more storyline. So wait, whose storyline do we still have? To we get haven't through? done Terry's yet. We, uh, yeah, we, Terry's. we we started to, but I wanted to go ahead and get Steve out of the way because fuck Steve. Fuck Steve. Or actually, no, Lori, don't fuck Steve. I don't care that he stayed in California. Do not fuck Steve. Yeah, Steve's plotline is basically just him hanging around with this girl who's just like a little bit like he he gets a free car from I think it's Kurt. No, Terry. Gets it. The, Steve asks Terry to take care of his car, and they'll figure out how they're going to, uh, you know, whether he's going to take the car to college when he comes back for Christmas. Mm -hmm. And so Terry desperately wants to be cool, and Terry is not cool in any way, shape, or form. He, you know, the first sight we see of him is him driving his Vespa up, and he can't actually get the brakes to catch, so he slams into something. And then he's dressed like that. Yep. And then he hangs out with a girl who's just a little bit too hot for him and uh, lies to her a lot. A lot yeah, a lot, he's, a lot. he's trying to lie his way into being cool. And also her pants. And it works! Well, the former, the and, latter works. Yeah, and, and then when no, she gets to see end, how painfully uncool cool. he like, is. Yeah, I don't have a car, but I have a scooter. And she's like, well, that's basically a motorcycle, and I love guys who drive motorcycles. Because she's seen the actual him and she's like, well, you know, I've done worse. Yeah, I, I, I sort of like, I don't think she thinks he's cool so much as she like at that point kind of likes him for whatever reason. He's genuine, um, finally. Yeah, I, I think once he like, I, I, and it's a little bit like, you know, he, he is, he's sincere at that point. He's kind of nerdy, but he also, you know, he worked pretty hard. He got his car back or I guess Steve's car back. Also, he finally got the, the hooch from the guy that was robbing the place. He did get the hooch from the guy who was robbing the place. A and then he expelled all of his share of it out onto the pavement. The 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 comic beat, we're talking about wackiness, the comic beat of him standing outside the store, guy runs out, throws him the bottle, and then the store owner comes out with a gun and starts shooting very well timed. Very oh yeah, so great. That's that's kind of like all the plot lines. Well, oh no, that that's it. It's just you know the the whole thing with Terry is if you grow up feeling uncool, you desperately want to be cool, and then eventually you realize your desperate attempts to become cool are what are making you remain uncool, mm. and you hopefully 
finally get comfortable in your own skin and discover some form of coolness that you can actually make work. Yeah, I, I've said in the past, and I will say again, and maybe this is me like, you can tell me this is me comforting myself, you know, I play Warhammer, I'm not cool. But, you know, I think the people who are like, I'm going to pretend to like things I don't like and act in a way that I don't, is an inauthentic. Those oh my people, god, him yeah. digging his grave with like the hunting and the horses. And yes. The, I have a Jeep with all wheel drive. Like, no. No, you don't. I, he, I, it's simple, stupid. Yeah, those people are significantly less cool than like the guy at Comic Con in a Batman suit. The guy in the Batman suit's having a good time. Yeah. And I, I originally thought, like, I thought the reveal on the stuff with, like, the Jeep is she's going to know that he's bullshitting her because, like, it's such a transparent lie. Like, he, he's, like, talking about how he has horses or a Jeep to hunt bears and it's like, what the fuck are you talking about, dude? Where are there bears in Modesto, Terry? Despite the, uh, despite the flag. California flag? Despite the California flag, they don't, they don't really have that many bears out there. At least until uh, it gets nuked and the two-headed ones show up. He, he can't exactly say the girl that he's trying to have sex with. He can't tell her that he's got a girlfriend in Canada, so he's got to go with something. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I did uh, do a little checking, and Terry is how George Lucas felt he was in high school. Kurt is how George Lucas felt he was in college. And hopefully... Explain why those two had the, uh, the meteor storylines. And hopefully... George Lucas it was never at any point anything like Steve. No, but he apparently did do some r street racing for a while, so that's where Milner comes in. So wait, yeah. if he wasn't actually all that like Steve, where the fuck did Steve come from, and why did we have to deal with him? So that it could rhyme. Being, you know, so that it could rhyme is funny, but being more sincere, don't know if y'all if know this about me, but I am transgender, so I did hang out with guys a lot in high school, and like the the specific kind of shittiness that that Steve is, obviously it wasn't one to one because I didn't grow up in the seventies or the sixties. But like that that is not an inauthentic portrayal of a specific kind of guy in high school. Not a kind of guy you really want to know. Yeah, it, he's the sort of guy who go who will make sure that you know that he's a nice guy, and then he does this shit that he does with his girlfriend. But no, the, to do a more serious response than just the it rhymes, although that is relevant, it's just he's there to serve as the foil reverse mirror, however you want to think of it, to Kurt. That, you know, he, he thinks he's got everything figured out, that his life is going to be a specific way and he's going to go do this and be great. And Kurt thinks, I'm going to burn out. This is going to be horrible. I'm not going to do it. And we watch them take each other's starting position so that each one at the end of the movie is where the other one was at the beginning. He's just there to be a narrative foil for Kurt and also to loan Terry his car. It, it's interesting because like I the the vibe I was getting from from Steve throughout the uh the second half of the movie is that he is genuinely kind of like hurt by the breakup. But I don't know when I'm looking back at the movie, like I'm sort of thinking about it. I don't know how much of that is is the script and how much of that is just Ron Howard. It's a popular cliche that the person who thinks they have the high ground in the relationship is like, hey, I think we need to adjust things. And then the other one, whether, you know, regardless of the reasons, is like, okay, fine, I'm going to lean into this. Wait, you're supposed to need me more than I need you. What the hell? Oh, so how do we feel about Candy Clark being the only actor from the movie to get an act acting nomination? I think the only actor from any Lucas film, unless no, Alec Guinness got a said, uh, nomination okay. Okay, for so, Obi Wan. Yeah, that's what I was about to say. Like, I think he was the only, I think so only one of two from Lucas's film. Honestly, I think she kind of got the nomination because this was at a point when, like, getting a lot of recognition for the movie was kind of how you reassured yourself that the movie was good. And, like, looking at who she was up against in the category, she was never going to win because it was Tatum O'Neill and Madeline Kahn for Paper Moon. Tatum O'Neill won. Linda Blair in The Exorcist. And then Sylvia mm -hmm. Sidney in something called Summer Wishes, Winter Dreams, which I don't know what that is. Never but, heard of like, that one. 
just the paper moon and the exorcist one candy yeah. clark was never gonna win i'm sorry i i will say she deserved the nomination because her performance is one of the best in the movie in my estimation she she's playing a character who maybe doesn't have a whole lot of interior life but she's a nice person she's a genuine human being and you know and lord knows we don't necessarily get those in a lot of movies mm -hmm. and her bits it feels like she's just it feels like it's not scripted she she is very good in this movie i went and looked because i was curious i went and looked at her career you know, reasonably i thought i'd seen her someplace before uh, she's mary lou in the man who fell to earth yep which is a very good movie. She's also in Criterion Collection classic Cool as Ice. And this was the second movie she acted in. Second movie she acted in. She it's I think you're right, Sam, that like she didn't have a prayer. Paper Moon was a big juggernaut that year. The Exorcist was like this was the year of the Sting and the Exorcist being the big stuff. I'm not gonna <laughs> question that, but as we're wrapping up, I do want to mention one other thing. Did anybody else notice a distinct lack of graffiti in this movie called American Graffiti? I don't know why it's called that. I don't know what the title means. I have no idea. With Star Wars, you're getting exactly what it says in the package, A War in the Stars. I guess it, it's kind of like a vibe title, but you're right, there's no graffiti once you count the vandalizing the cop car oh my god I i'm reading in the universal did object to the film's title not knowing what american graffiti meant lucas was dismayed when some executives assumed he was making an italian movie about feet the studio therefore submitted a long list of over 60 alternative titles with their favorite being another slow night in modesto and coppola's rock around the block they pushed hard to get Lucas to adopt any of the titles, but he was displeased with all the alternatives and persuaded Tannen to keep American Graffiti. Yeah, it, it makes no sense, but it just operates on pure vibes. It's a good title. It's an eye-catching title. I think Another Slow Night in Modesto is a fucking terrible title. So Rock Around the Block would be a good title for something that was just about the pharaohs. I also think that's the title that became the title of another movie later, right? Maybe, I don't know, you probably know more movies than I do, but I don't, I don't know. know. It doesn't feel like there's enough theme to tie into the graffiti part of it. I don't know. I think the the end, the way that you capture the movie's vibes, I think you probably got to play up the soundtrack in the title, but there's no way to do that. American uh, is, mix, well, mixtapes weren't a thing back then, were they? No. When yeah. did mixtapes become a thing? 80s. When we got 80s. CDs. But like even back then, you know, selling movies on their soundtrack was not unheard of, and it is a it is a killer soundtrack. Yeah, I mean, I might poke around my library see if there's an American Graffiti soundtrack available for me, but I don't know. I think well, what I think could best be summed up when I ask the question: Is the force with it? For me, it is. This is the sort of movie that it's best on your second or third viewing. Like I said, it runs on vibes. It's the sort of thing that is not groundbreaking, no huge drama. It's just a moment in these people's lives. And then we move on and we get a few notices of what happened to them afterward. It's a look at a world that doesn't exist anymore. And it's got a lot of scenes that are basically just air and then a few scenes that are so goddamn good so for me at least it uh, it is with it i know that i do this a lot i'm sorry that i have to do it again i think i'm going to have to answer only a sith feels an absolute <laughs> like um, god ellie i'm sorry my opinion would you okay let me ask this a different way would you watch it again i don't i don't know it's it's so hard to like separate it as a I think I'm gonna have to go with the force is not with it because like I don't know it was a huge hit and it was reasonably critically acclaimed at its time period but like I don't know if it would have survived as a movie if it weren't for its connection to the biggest film franchise of all time so I don't know how to untangle that I don't how to how to take it on its own I mentioned I I compared it to like Bound to the Wachowski sisters, the Matrix. But the difference there is I think it sounds just really fucking good. And I don't know if this really holds together. It has a handful of scenes in it that I really love. And a lot of just kind of, okay. So I, I think if I have to choose 
with it or not with it, I, I will have to say not with it. All right. Well, I have no instinct to dither. The force is not with it for me. I do not want to revisit this. This is far too much of an insight into George Lucas's mind for me. If I am going to do that, I think I categorically need the additional filter of space fantasy. But, you know, there's always the chance that I'll roll a one and we'll get to visit the sequel at some point. Who has pluggables? I have nothing. Not even uh, if you like this, then try this uh, this time. I, it's just, I was just mainly happy to be here. If you like this movie, try another obscure movie by the director called Star Wars. <laughs> I hear that one has poetry. It, it rhymes. Rhymes. My my plugs, as always, I can be found on Twitter and Blue Sky at LSR42. I can be found at Tumblr at Football and Tuxedos. Once every three months or so, I publish something on Medium at LSR42. And as of a few weeks ago, I have my own podcast where I and two guests watch one a film that has been non, that has won an Oscar and discuss it. And with the requirement being that one of the three people on it has to have never seen it. It's called Biggest Night in Podcasting. Check it out. As for me, I will ask that you keep the spirit of Star Wars alive by supporting artists through the Entertainment Community Fund and by taking action to support anti-imperial and anti-colonial movements across the globe, partially by using links provided below and by taking action in your community. And you can find me on the wider internet as La Femme Fictionale, including on YouTube, Twitter, and Tumblr, where you can also find the blog for this show. Our theme music is provided by Refractory Period, the two girls one beat synth pop sensation. You can follow them on Instagram at Refractory Period the Band. To further support this podcast, please subscribe to us on your platform of choice, leave reviews, consider joining Patreon, and share with your friends to boost our visibility. And now it's time to turn to the Chance Cube to decide where our journey takes us next. That's a three. Three is the number, and the number will be three. Five is oh, right out. No, I already know what this is. Um, I'm going to like turn down my volume a little bit as I say this. It's bound. Yeah. Holy shit. Yes. I'm in on that episode. This is, not a, this is not a request. All right. Well, we'll see you all for Pride Month. Until then, stay safe, stay strong, stay beautiful, and may the Force be with you. Mm-hmm.